Hi everyone, welcome to today's uh, Get Ideas Google Hangout on uh, learning trends. We're excited to have a great group of folks with us here today. Um, a little bit about Get Ideas, it's a community for education system leaders. It's been around for, for about four years now and we really have uh, taken advantage of sharing a lot of incredible content with education system leaders over the years. This series of uh, Google Hangouts has started back in January and we've been uh, really focused on four major trends that we see happening today in education. One is around cultivating leadership, one is around technology driven innovation, one is around um, um, modern learning environments, and then also about the future of digital content. Um, this is the final uh, Google Hangout in the series, and we have a great uh, group of folks here today, very enthusiastic, uh, long-seasoned uh, education uh, uh, consultants uh, and reformers and transformers and innovators in this field. Field. So I'm really excited about uh, talking about these various trends with each and every one of you. Let me quickly introduce everyone uh, who's going to be on this Google Hangout today and, um, and then we'll kick off with some great questions. Uh, Pam Allen is the um, is the founder and leader of Lit World, a global literacy initiative serving children across the world. Jim Jim Jerry has served the Illinois Mathematic and Science Academy since 2001 as Chief Information Officer and most recently as the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Director. Rose Hoosen is currently the Instructional Design Technology Specialist at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Chip Kimball has come to us all the way from Singapore. He's the superintendent of the Singapore American School. Uh, it just started there in 2012. And prior to that, he served as the superintendent of Lake Washington School District. Stephanie Pace Marshall is the founding president uh, of the Illinois Mathematic and Science Academy. In addition to that, we have Alan November, who is an international Hello, Alan, a uh, leader in education technology and owner of November Learning, and Mike Shearson, who's executive director of the School for Global Education and Innovation uh, currently at U Kern University in New Jersey. Uh, several of you have joined me in the past on some of these Google Hangouts, and uh, so I welcome you all back. And I'd love to kick this conversation off with talking a little bit about, um, let's start first with the future of digital content. We know that uh, it's changing, it's evolving. Uh, we know that education system leaders are uh, many times embracing it and uh, oftentimes grappling with what the trends are. And I'd love for uh, someone to jump in here and talk a little bit about what they see as the current trends uh, in digital content for education leaders. Anyone like to start off with some thoughts? How about Stephanie? Why don't you join us uh, <laughs> talking about what you're seeing uh, in Illinois right now? Uh, well, I guess when the question provoked uh, a response along the lines of digital content within the context of or digital content and. So I think uh, there's no question that content um, uh, is being made more accessible, uh, more personalized, uh, far more adaptive, and far more individualized uh, due to digital technology, and that's a good thing. My own predisposition is that uh, digital content needs to be coupled with active, hands-on, real-life experience and inquiry. So um, I think my, or my orientation is always uh, what is the context in which learning happens? What is the context in which content is embedded? Let me just stop there. Rose, any uh, any thoughts about uh, yes, about I these do. trends? Um, when when you say digital content, I I would I would say perhaps content itself is just not enough. It's the interaction that that counts. Um, I think we've all heard of MOOCs, and and that's probably why uh, Paul Kim and myself were asked to be involved in this. Um, when you talk about going digital or going on the internet, we're not just 
putting stuff out there. We are expecting people to interact and to make connections. Uh, George uh, Siemens and Stephen Downs uh, in 2008, they, they, they came up with this word connectivism and unfortunately it's still not quite accepted in the academic circles as a theory but uh, some of us already do. When you put content out there, people will interact with each other and that that is actually where the learning occurs. It's not the objects, the learning objects that cause the learning. It's how people interact with those objects and then with each other. That's what makes the learning happen. And Alan, you run that wonderful summer program uh, and have for years really focusing on helping teachers, instructors, uh, system leaders really understand how to manipulate that content. <laughs> I've attended your conferences, they're great. <laughs> what, are, what are some of the trends that you've seen, you're yeah. seeing of late in this? Right. Well, this, this year we, we certainly intend to do a lot more crowdsourcing. So um, having the participants, you know, a standard workshop is smartest guy in the room, theoretically standing at the front, and but now with the connectedness, you want to get the room to know what the room knows and build capacity for everyone to continue to con learn beyond any one event in time. So the whole concept of school is, is what really needs to shift. So <laughs> the, the current concept is you go to a classroom, there's a teacher, you get content that's more or less directed um, and Ideally, I think one of the most interesting questions surrounding digital content is who's working harder, the teacher or the students? <laughs> and, and before we get to digital content, I think in a lot of classrooms, the teacher's working harder. And in this connected world, you, kids are doing the heavy lifting or participants are doing the heavy lifting. And that means they're contributing, they're editing, they're linking, uh, they're posing the questions. They're, they're creating new spin-off sub-communities. So it's a very dynamic, as everyone has said, uh, I think the key word is connectedness. And conceptually, uh, it's a shift of owning that learning. And, and as Stephanie said, you know, being personalized and individualized, while at the same time being connected. I, I, this is Pam, and i um, happy to be here with everybody. I, I could not agree with that more. I'm thinking about the work that I do um, running literacy initiatives around the world and we've created a platform where our lit club uh, leaders around the world can actually um, create their content and share it with us and even obviously across language and cultures there's so many many ways that teaching around uh, literacy empowerment is so universal and especially when we're using children's own stories to actually make that come alive. So what I've been so struck by is that when we share that sort of sourcing, like the way that we're saying here, this idea of crowdsourcing content, crowdsourcing education, it feels so powerful for people to think that in my small rural village in Bungamba, Kenya, I can actually be a teacher of teachers um, for teachers right here in urban New York City. And um, it's just an incredibly, it's just so transformational for everybody to think of themselves like that. that you know, there's an old uh, saying I, I heard somewhere once in, um, I can't remember where, but the sort of idea, the question was, who's the teacher and who's the learner? And I think that's really what the digital content is doing for us, is it's breaking that boundary between teacher and learner, and for me to watch as women who did not ever get a chance to go to secondary school are becoming teachers of people around the world just by posting a video or recommending a really good way to get kids to tell a story. Um, they are so empowered by that because they have access to, th to that digital universe and because they're making content that we all really love. Right. Pam, let me, let me add on to what you're saying. This is Jim Gary. Um, I think for me it's student as creator is one of the very powerful things and you mentioned that and I think the other one is student as collaborator these are two transformation roles that don't ad exist in a traditional uh, school setting in my opinion this is uh, chip and and probably I think with all of the 
um, voices that are saying that this is a very interesting and dynamic and transformational way to think about content. And the question is, why hasn't it shifted faster? And part of that is driven by the tensions that exist in the system that we need to be uh, realistic about. But one is the control uh, that publishers have on the industry, um, financially, pedagogically, and uh, uh, content-wise. A second tension out there is um, systems, so large school systems, um, and it's different for places like IMSA and even places like Singapore American School, but when you have a large district, there is a, 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 a tension around wanting to have a common guaranteed viable curriculum, which is in the literature, et cetera, which runs contrary often to a digital content world which is flexible and is uh, individualized. So that's another tension. And then the third tension is um, uh, many times the learning which is oriented towards a flexible and uh, interactive content based, the one that, that uh, Jim and Alan and others described, often goes deeper into that content base rather than what's required. So when we think of it for our, for our students, um, it's what do they need in order to be admitted to a college of choice? And often that is content coverage, not necessarily depth. And so what we need to do as leaders is think about those tensions and how do we break down those tensions to actually create an environment where we think it's going to be most productive for kids. Because the environment that all of you described is absolutely what's going to be most productive for kids. But we've got to deal with policy, we've got to deal with publishers, we've got to deal with practice, and we've got to deal with outcomes in order to actually push or move the needle in that direction. Uh, Chip, this is uh, Mike Searson. Uh, I agree with uh, what you've said, and I think the uh, stakes for the involvement of publishers have just increased dramatically with Common Core. I'm a little yep. concerned about the role that the publishers and test makers will now play. Uh, when when uh, Jim had used the term, of, when he's talking about the context of collaboration and people taking ownership, I became nervous when he used the term students. I like to think in terms of learners because I, I think your point, Chip, about this place called school and the structures that formal education settings place upon us and how much it changes the nature of learning. I mean, uh, if you look at this from a cognitive, from a developmental perspective, much of what happens in the classroom is not how people really learn, not how they really collaborate. Right. I, I, I agree 100 percent. And one of the interesting things is those who are uh, pretty heavy reformers, I would probably stand in, in that crowd. Um, what you end up with is a desire to reform. You look at all of the cognitive research. You look at all of the conditions around learning. And what we end up being faced with is these impenetrable structures that make it almost impossible to actually change the system in a fundamental way that aligns with what you just described. Yeah. I mean, Alan, uh, I think, started off by, by sort of twisting or shifting the conversation uh, from, from digital content to it as a disruptive innovation for the transformation of schooling. And I think that's where we are now in terms of the, the paradigm that we're in, the structures that we're in, the processes that we're in, the identity that we're in. I mean, I have gotten to thinking that the current, uh, the current place we call school uh, is really guilty of identity theft because who we are as learners, how we learn as human beings, how we create meaning, how we find purpose and seek autonomy and freedom and all of those things is so totally mitigated in places called schools. So it seems like um, we can use digital content and all it provides, uh, assuming we deal with it with wisdom, uh, and the structures that uh, Chip talked about, uh, the, the, for me, the, the conversation is really a transformation one. It's not a reform conversation. And it really creates uh, the need for not only a new narrative and a new map, but a fundamentally different lexicon. Because we cannot use the old language to describe this new phenomenon. I shriek when I hear the world, the word classroom. Um, we have to come up with different kinds of language to describe the dynamic living environment. I mean, learning is a live encounter. It cannot happen in dead 
classrooms. I mean, we can bring classrooms to life if we keep that name, but why in the name of heaven do we not work specifically to change the lexicon so we can have a fun mentally different conversation. If I can jump in right here, um, uh, I, I'd like to share, if I can, this image. Um, this is our classroom uh, that we run under the MOOCs. Um, <laughs> it's not a classroom, it's the entire world. The MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, um, and, and even then, I'll, I'll tell you later, we changed the word course now. Um, mm -hmm. The MOOC that was yeah, run good. was almost 20,000 students from 170 countries. Now you were talking about using the word learner as opposed to using the word uh, student. Here's another image. We had students all the way down from middle school to grandpas and grandmas in this MOOC. We had over uh, 500 PhD holders, 2,000 master's holders, professors from around the world intermingling with these middle school students and high school students all learning together. And it, it's a whole different ball game when you are talking about online learning and having people interact, not just with the digital artifacts that are on the platform, but also between people. Um, and so I, I, I applaud you, Stephanie, for, for bringing up that point. Uh, we, we really have to go away from this concept of classroom. It, it, it isn't, because you're talking about the entire world. Uh, yeah. This is Pam. Uh, I just wanted to say that, that um, I'm, I find it so fascinating and wonderful to listen to everybody. And I think one thing that for me, as somebody who spends a lot of time in classrooms and in, in urban, the urban United States especially, um, I, I'm particularly concerned with the fact that although all this transformation is it's happening and it's, it's, it's just beyond exhilarating on some level, that many more... and let's use the word learning environments maybe rather than classrooms or some. I like the idea of making new names for everything very much. Um, but I would say that my biggest concern right now is, and maybe it's just a very simple one, is access. And access, um, I've been campaigning for access for my entire career uh, around literature and text and having kids holding books in their hands and going between home and school with books wherever and however we're going to get them books. And now with the technology that we have, there is no excuse for our children not to have access to information. We don't even need to give them books. We just need to give them phones. And so when I see in a Detroit public school that the teenagers are being asked to turn their phones over when they enter in you know, through the security gates, I think to myself, they could keep those phones and actually use them as a way to sign on to a MOOC or sign on to a friend's conversation or participate in class. And I think we all have to get a lot more uh, active in, in politicizing this idea that the schools in this country do not have access, children do not have access to the technology they deserve and, and the open source that they actually require in order to be part of the 21st century. And I actually think back to the publishers, I think, hey, you know what? If we can show them that that's a monetized sort of possibility and they get that technology into schools, I'm all for it. I don't care who does it. I just want to make sure that our kids get the access they deserve because they never have gotten it when it comes to text. So the thought that they're going to get it with technology, I get, I get very discouraged about that. But I, I want us all just to sort of know that it's such a, it's such a gap. It's such a gap. Can I um, can I ask all of you to because this is uh, this is interesting and I think it's a, a thread which is what does leadership have to do how are we going to cultivate the leadership to make some of the many changes that you're talking about what are the challenges that they face and what are the things and uh, going back to what Chip said about some of the challenges that are, you know in implementing some of these things or even what Stephanie you said in terms of changing the vocabulary or the language around some of this, it really does take a certain type of groundswell of support and then support from the top going down. So what, what do they need to be doing differently or doing more of or think about? So this is under that cultivating well, let, leadership. Let me just jump in with, a, I guess, a um, a belief born from experience, and that is it is very difficult, if not impossible, maybe that's a little bit of a stretch, but it's very difficult to create what you have not become. So if we are really talking about transformation, which is not fixing what is, but change, changing the fundamental form and nature of something, the kind of learner that we are 
uh, sort of inferentially talking about relative to how they think uh, and how they come to know uh, and how they judge truth and how they collaborate and work, etc. Those same characteristics need to be true of leaders, plus a huge dose uh, of adaptive capacity and wisdom. So that the leaders, in, in my view, the leaders need, need um, similar levels of uh, interdisciplinary thinking capacity, inquiry-based thinking capacity, design-based thinking, and certainly a whole systems approach to school transformation. <clears throat> this is Chip. Uh, you know, the leadership question is an interesting one, and I would simply say that leadership is everything. Um, if you <laughs> don't have um, uh, high caliber, mm -hmm. flexible, and courageous leadership, um, the likelihood of having any kind of transformational change is almost um, uh, almost zero. And, and and part of the question is, what does that leadership actually do? Um, I would make the argument that although I agree with Pam that uh, access, for example, is an issue, the primary issue is around pedagogy. It is a, uh, it is around culture building, a culture of innovation, a culture of how we think about teaching and learning, and shifting cultures inside of schools and leadership is 100 percent responsible for creating a culture where learning can exist in the most powerful way possible. That is leadership's responsibility. And if leaders would focus entirely on building that culture, then the system changes that we would, we would hope to have might be possible. Bravo. <laughs> Here, I, I, I'd like to just throw in some fun. Uh, you can do this tomorrow as a leader, because I think that <laughs> Chip, Chip, you're an amazing leader, and and Stephanie, and 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 I, and I agree. Both of you live it. But to go from being trained at a university to be an administrator, to being the kind of transformational leader you're talking about, can take years and years. So here's here's my uh, recipe for immediately getting into it. Number one, you got to play, play computer games with some of your students, <laughs> and those games have to be connected to the internet. <laughs> and you have to understand that you will lose badly. <laughs> that you will be destroyed. You won't just lose. You will be destroyed. And humility. And, uh, humility. Thank you. Humility. humility. <laughs> okay, stop it, stop it. <laughs> I'm going to jump in live. on that. You You're talking live. about the games, Chip. You will live. And <laughs> but the experience of, of feeling that kind of failure. Uh, while while your twelve year old you know sixth grader is, is commanding armies around the world, I think <laughs> the necessary step toward good leadership is to feel abject failure. If you like, I'll give you five more, but that would be number one. I, I'd like to share this picture. I've got another one here. You're talking about games. Here yes. we've got games. Um, are you guys seeing this? I hope I hope you can see it. Um, the uh, the game that uh, we're showing over here, the MOOC that we ran uh, was was so successful that some of the graduates they shared um, their knowledge beyond the MOOC, and now they have gone and created their own MOOC. This is actually a MOOC that's running right now. It's in week three, and it, it was just a class project. I mean, you want to talk about the terminology. It's a classroom project, but now it's a MOOC. Um, these people, they've gone out, and they've created their own MOOC, and they're running it. This is a, a crazy game. They, they go out, and they do, just like you said, uh, sort of real, real life, real time um, ideas, uh, and the ideas so that people will learn how to get along with each other in the world. I also want to point out, um, did you say something about uh, leadership? Uh, I, I, I'm going to quote this. You know, Paul Kim. He, he's the one who ran the the first generation of this MOOC, and he said, uh, "Just just do it. You know, forget about leadership and, and permission and all that. Just get it done, fail, and learn from your mistakes, and don't worry about it after that." One of the things that's interesting in both, I think, Alan's um, <clears throat> jovial suggestion as well as 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 what happens in gaming is. Uh, students learn from failure, and school systems are designed to actually discourage learning through failure. Absolutely true. And um, and the more uh, the more competitive we have become, the more failure 
has actually mm -hmm. become disallowed inside of the school system. And the essence of gaming and why kids are attracted to it mm -hmm. is because they fail and they learn how to be successful. They fail and they learn how to be successful. And then they learn out and they learn that way. We have got to figure out how to create schools that actually failure is part of the core value of what we do. And That's, it's coupled with the sense of agency. I mean, kids feel empowered. It's not a, a failure and a sense of loss, but it's a right. sense of agency building capacity. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and as a matter of fact, one of the things that I think is one of our big limiters is if you think about um, college entrance admission is one of our primary goals, especially in a, in a high-achieving school like SAS. And you know, if, if, a, if a student gets one B in a class, um, the, 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 it, it destroys them, and so as a result of that, grades have become so high stakes, and AP exams have become so high stakes that kids won't take risks at all in any way, shape, or form within the context of the curriculum. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Well said. It's true. That's a vicious cycle too, because everybody is kind of trying. Everyone, if you're learning in a fear-based environment, then you know, everything suffers. I mean, even I'm thinking in terms of also families, thinking about low literacy families who have come to me and said, I really want the opportunity to learn to read with my child. This is my big chance. Um, with the openness or this idea of this transformational community environment for learning, it doesn't have to be the child anymore also taking a chance and taking risks. It's also the parents, the families in that community coming and learning to read for the first time and doing that in a virtual way or doing it through digital, digital communities around school or you know they work long hours. They can't come to that PTA meeting but they can be part of this learning community and that's, that's my hope. That's one of the things that will happen mm -hmm. in this yep. new era. Yep. And I, one of the things that I'm hoping will happen, I'm gonna, since we've got um, our friend from Stanford on the line, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Stanford out. <laughs> uh, and that is, um, I think that one of the things that we need to see from a transformational perspective, I mean, Stanford is doing some phenomenal work in terms of MOOC, MOOCs and the de delivering of, of content in new ways. But the question that I'm going to throw out to for Stanford to consider is, what is Stanford or USC or Princeton or the University of Texas, what are large university is doing in order to change the game in terms of how you look at students in order to in order to enroll them in your universities because w today we, we this year have interviewed a hundred admissions officers from universities across the US and unequivocally it still comes down to GPA SAT AP and an essay and when is it that we will really find ways that you will be able to evaluate what kids know from a learner perspective rather than just their ability to perform on those particular metrics? And it's hard because scaling those kinds of things is hard. Scale actually is, in my mind, one of the biggest detriments. It's hard for the universities. It's hard for large pub public K-12 systems. Is You can take an innovation, but how do you scale that innovation so that it's actually manageable to create a system. Um, when I heard uh, one of the Stanford professors talk about MOOCs, one of the uh, compelling parts of MOOCs is taking education to scale for the first time in our history. How do we scale other parts of the system so that we actually um, uh, have learning? So, Stanford University, <laughs> let's play. <laughs> oh no, um, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Stanford because I can get people into serious trouble, <laughs> okay? Um, but what I will say is this, um, I'm going to show uh, this, let's see, screen share, there you go. Um, Paul Kim, he, he's a renegade, uh, I, oh I shouldn't say that in public, should I? Um, <laughs> well, you know, he, he started this MOOC and, and one thing, I'm going to share this other picture here, take a look at this. Um, the MOOC, yes, we're talking about people who are highly educated who join these MOOCs, but they're also people who are from, you know, third world countries. And this is an example of a project, School on Wheels. This is in Bangladesh. And, you know, yes, these people may never come to Stanford or to USC or to MIT or Harvard. But uh, I'm going to quote a story that, that Paul Kim uh, said in, in, in an earlier um, panel discussion. 
he brings students um, from the United States or from anywhere, any volunteers. He's got students who come in uh, and volunteer to go to different countries and do these mobile learning uh, projects, uh, digital learning, you know, putting all these um, artifacts online for people to learn and that's how it's being scaled. You don't have to go to Stanford to get a Stanford education. You need to learn. Uh, we need to focus more on the learning and not on the paperwork, not on the actual qualifications because you know what, um, and I quote Paul, uh, and I laughed when I first heard this, he says, you know what, when we go to these countries, these guys don't even know what Stanford at MIT means, but they do know what learning means. And so I think it's it's us educators who have to stop thinking about um, the the paper qualification as much as um, the actual learning itself. And and I think that that's it's the mindset. You got to change yeah. the mindset. It's yeah. it's not about the paperwork. Yeah. I Roz, I I agree with what you said. And Chip's question still stands because there are no seriously. I no, mean, I, yeah, I yeah. I mean, but we I can't speak we on are very. Now. No, no, we're, we, we love the construct and the idea, and, and we see some MOOCs that we think are really powerful, and what Coursera is doing, there's some enormous, um, tremendous access to people who would not have access. That said, um, there are kids who, uh, uh, who want to go to colleges and universities, and they don't want to go, they, they want to look at what um, I have called for a long time, and Jim knows this, a fundamentally different ROI. So uh, cu currently, you know, we know what the what the uh, return is. It's AP score, it's SAT, it's a, it's a, all the stuff that, that Chip said. So what if a kid decided he or she would test the system and sit down with, because the University of Chicago does look at other things. They came in with a portfolio. They came in with a digital portfolio and they showed examples of problems they have solved, uh, uh, challenges that they have identified and helped to resolve. People around the world, to Pam's point, that they have helped to, to resolve some issues collaboratively. They come in with a series of their inquiry agenda, what they have been, uh, the questions that they have been framing over a, peri of a period of time. What happens if they come in with 400 credentials or certificates from universities where they have taken a quote-unquote course and they plop on the desk of an admission officer um, certificates from 400 courses from Stanford and U of C and Harvard and MIT and Princeton and say, all right, I have taken these courses. Now, I don't have a degree, but so I, I think Chip's question is a really important one. How are we going to say to the learner, um, we want to assess what you know, how you have come to learn it, what you will do with that, um, your habits of mind, the way you think, um, and we value that as much if not more than an AP or an IB or whatever, and somebody needs to, needs to start to take a chance on, on different ways of, uh, of um, asserting and credentialing learning. Um, we have a question from the audience that I want to uh, raise, and um, it's specifically around some of the mega trends that uh, you all might be see, you know, observing happening today. Uh, the the person points out Common Core, right, which is a big change, whether we agree with it or not, or disagree or have different opinions about it is, is not the point. It's just that it is something that is disruptive in, in terms of how it's changing education. What are some of the other mega trends that um, you all are seeing? And I'd like you to think about it globally. Mike, I know that you work specifically in, in a variety of capacities in education around the world. Are there some trends that really are beginning to happen, um, you know, in various regions uh, around the world. Yes. Mike, so let me one point that one, to you. Okay, yes. So one trend would be uh, with mobile devices. Uh, there are certain countries in the world that will not be hardwired, will never have Ethernet, uh, will not have fiber optics, and they're using mobile devices and cell towers. Uh, so we are, this is something UNESCO is looking at very carefully. 
particularly uh, what we refer to as developing nations. So the ability to del deliver content across many barriers, uh, physical, te technological barriers, is, is aided greatly by using mobile devices. Uh, the penetration of mobile devices across the world is extraordinary. We've never had anything like that happen in human history. There are very few villages, if not individuals, families or villages that don't have a mobile device. So we can now get content and education literally in the hands of people across the world. Uh, I think mobile learning is another issue. I think there's very little mobile learning that's happening, but I can say that there's a lot of content across the world being delivered through mobile devices right now. I think the, um, the tr oh, Jim, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, one of the trends I wanted to mention is uh, what I would call three-to-one devices, where we're seeing students all over uh, having more than one device that they're uh, continually using. And uh, what does that mean for us educationally? What does it mean for them? Um, how do we take advantage of the fact that we know that they have these devices? Interestingly enough, the trend is, is uh, for more devices at the lower income levels than they are at the middle and higher income levels. Um, so I think that's mm. something we need to be considering uh, as we look at trends. I think that as we look at, for example, Common Core is mentioned as a mega trend. I would argue that it's simply a reformation and, and sadly a poor one in my opinion. Um, but trends are much bigger than Common Core. And I think those are the ones we should really be paying attention to. Yeah, I want to jump on that because um, uh, knowledge works that we're all familiar with uh, periodically does uh, sort of the, the future uh, decade by decade and their most recent report which was uh, 20, for 2040 I thought the trends that they named were extremely powerful and they create in my mind um, the, the trends that they have identified if we juxtapose them with the quote-unquote trends uh, that we just named one it is common core a trend they almost create um, a bipolar condition in the educational community. So we have the expectations of common core and then we have personalized and individualized learning. So what Knowledge Works has identified, which again I found fascinating, is um, they call it unbundling schools as we know it. And you know, we're familiar with Khan Academy, we've talked about Coursera. So the unbundling of school, school anytime, anyplace, anywhere, decoupling uh, and reimagining learner-teacher relationships. And I guess I would think, from my perspective, that's one of the most important and certainly has implications for leadership. Because when you change the dynamics of relationships around learning and, teach and teaching, you fundamentally begin to change the patterns of interaction. And when you change patterns in a dynamic system, you begin to change a lot of things. So um, global collaboration, mentorships, um, community-based problem solving, uh, I think those are more the global trends that really will make a difference relative to who we are as learners as opposed to um, more, um, I guess, politically motivated uh, uh, strategies for um, more quality that, that uh, I guess I would define the common core. One of the things that um, I thought about from a global trend perspective, which is kind of this topic, is uh, a, a, a globalization. Um, uh, students who understand cultural competence and understand how to work in a global world will have the best advantage to be successful in the future. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I moved to Singapore was my fear was that American students and American educators don't get it when it comes to globalization. And having now been here for just under a year, I think I was right. And um, uh, the, uh, it, and so globalization is one of those trends that is going to be a mega trend that is going to transform or at least inform uh, education for some time to come. I would just say, um, in terms of trends globally, one big one that I think is really promising is the uh, Education First initiative, which just launched this month. Um, I had the pleasure to be in Washington for that. Um, and when I, the trend or the shift there, the big shift in that is not only getting this idea of our, and I think maybe and possibly technology is really responsible for this, is that it's no longer so much about the millennium goal of getting kids into school, but what does a quality 
quality learning environment look like and how can we guarantee one for every child whether or not they're ever going to get into what looks like a traditional school it may be that they are you know in circumstances that prevent them from that whether they're in a refugee camp or in a very rural area that we can still provide and we have the obligation to provide that human right of education to every single child who ever lives among us and I see this global trend the discourse internationally is really shifting right now and I find that to be incredibly promising and I'll say just one quick thing about the Common Core is I do think it has potential I think it is an opportunity it's not telling us what to teach it's giving us a, a guidepost and I actually think there's a lot we can do with that if we want to be transformational Pam, I like your um, your introduction of the word um, environment, learning environment, how we have to look at various different things to um, leverage how students learn. I'd like to introduce another word, ecosystem. A lot of people think of learning environment just as that one entity called school or classroom or whatever terminology you want to use for it but it's it's actually a whole entire ecosystem you right. need to look at the family you need to look at the community at uh, the even even the political unrest uh, of whatever situations that the student the learners are in and and again even the word student is no longer as valid as it used to be because as much as the student is learning the teacher is learning too so I think the word learner as what I think was it Michael who introduced that idea let's just call everybody learners and not not student teacher or class classroom or whatever. Ecosystem is the entire, the entire thing together. Here is a trend I'd like to start that I'm, that I'm worried does not exist. <laughs> um, and, and I think it is interesting to go You've back. You've heard it time. first right here. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, yeah, you heard it first. <laughs> I know, I know um, one professor, a guy named Eric Mazur, ha happens to be mm -hmm. Dean of Applied Physics at Harvard. Right. And he has very carefully recorded his students' questions of the last couple of years. He has 4,500 questions. I don't know another teacher in the world who has carefully studied students' questions the way Eric Mazur has. If, if any of you know this, you've got to tell me who, who this other person is. And what's fascinating is when we focus on students' questions, not, not the answers, See, the teachers know the answers. What teachers don't know are students' questions. And, and Missouri would say that he wouldn't have imagined 90% of those questions. Yeah. And mm. Missouri would go on to say that the more knowledge you have as a teacher, the less prepared you are to understand your students' approach as a first-time learner. So the trend I'd love to start is that every day, every teacher for homework asks every student to ask a question. And those questions are tagged and organized in a database and carefully studied by teachers to figure out much more carefully how do we personalize instruction. Oh, I love uh, and I would, I would uh, I love support it. that, uh, Alan, and yeah. also say that um, uh, the question, the ability to question and ask good questions yes. is, is also a, a leadership trait. Great leader. Know how to ask good questions yes. and the right questions. I mean, you know, Marianne's role here. What we're doing, Marianne isn't giving us the answers. She's coming up right. with the most interesting questions. No, I don't. I don't have anyone to. to give, I don't have another name to to give you other than uh, that you offer with uh, uh, Mazur. But my parents. Um, I grew up in a house where at dinner time we were not asked what did you learn in school. Today? We were asked, how did you learn in school today, and did you ask a good question, and what was it? Yeah. Honestly. So that was, that was yeah. our dinner conversation. <laughs> wow. And, and this, it's interesting hearing you all speak because it does actually go back to what was talked about earlier in this conversation, which is, you know, um, the, the potential for building a risk-adverse society, right? You, you, yeah. You're afraid because you yeah. don't have the answer, and it's all about the answer. And what you're saying is turn this around and ask good questions, yeah. because then you'll gain you. the knowledge that you need. In, in fact, Stephanie and others, I, I, I had this wonderful uh, chance to hang out with uh, a guy named Stephen Wolfram. 
Oh, yes, of course. Oh, yeah. And, and, and <laughs> yep. you, you go hang out with Stephen Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try to come out of that with your brain. No, in, right. uh, yeah, good, good luck with that. Yeah. And, and so finally, you know, he invented Wolfram Alpha and a lot of yeah. other things. And I, I finally asked him, I said, okay, given everything you know about all the trends and the technology you've invented and Wolfram Alpha, what's the most important thing we should be teaching our children? And he said, the answers are all there. What are not there are the questions. So if we can, t in fact, um, Chip, isn't it true that the Ministry of Education of Singapore, if I were to type in, in a Google search right now, teach less, learn more, yeah. I would end up in a Singapore website. Yep. Yep. Even Singapore, who brought us the basic structure of No Child Left Behind, is abandoning that yeah. and going with this mantra, teach yeah. less, learn more. Yeah, yeah, yes, that is true. And what's interesting about what's happening in Singapore, uh, even though they are one of the top three comparables that the U.S. is constantly uh, yeah. trying to compare to, is they too are looking deeply at what is learning look like. Uh, they're asking the same questions. They are saying, uh, uh, teach uh, less, learn more, and they are um, very concerned about how do they stay uh, internationally competitive with with their yeah. own kids. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, it's interesting that, and I and I used to get into some very friendly, um, uh, quote unquote, battles with leaders of the uh, of, of AP. That other than um, mathematics, the Illinois Math and Science Academy does not teach AP courses for this very idea. And Singapore spent a lot of time at IMSA many, many, many years ago um, because our orientation and philosophy is um, is not to cram. I mean, AP has changed and it's gotten much better, um, but uh, the the uh, the the plethora of of content absent the context of using disciplines for, for problem solving um, was deadly to so many kids. So bravo for Singapore. Um, let me ask a question that's come in um, from one of our audience members and I, I, I'm going to rephrase it in a way. It came in from Alinda uh, Nietzsche, I think her last name is. Um, but it it's interesting too because all of you obviously are steeped in education, you're working in education, you're well educated yourself, you've gone through the formal training of, of education, whatever that may be. Um, but with all of the change that's going on, um, you know, do you see a shift around whether degrees are relevant? You know, do you see a shift coming along? You know, this gets back to that whole informal learning versus formal learning. And we all know the success stories of those individuals who never went to school or never had any kind of formal training. Do you see that coming about? Is that like some potentially in our future, or would you say it has to be one way or the other? I see. I do see a, a mind shift. Um, not in the answer to the question, but in a willingness to hold it uh, and ask, are there other ways to validate and credential uh, significant, deep, wise learning other than through uh, going through a, a, a college uh, or a, a post-secondary education? Are there other ways to continuously learn? I think people are willing to hold that as a question and so the space has opened, um, and I think that is a shift. Let me Sorry, suggest that we turn the tables a little bit. Take a look at Google, for example. When they hire employees, do you think they care about degrees? What does their interview process look like? And I'll tell you for sure, it yeah. has nothing to do with what degree you have. You have to get in there. You have to perform in a way very creatively that impresses them. They well, put they have you on the spot. You know, there's a, there's a movement right now. On online, um, we've got badges. There's another one that's come up. I, I took a look at it recently, and and it al it also came up. I think from from the same group of people. Um, it's called degreed. I'm not sure if anyone of you have heard of it. Uh, you you collect badges. You collect your degrees. You collect uh, w whatever it is that you collect. But you can also um, collect experiences. And so 
this degreed platform, what they do is they make an equivalency. They take your degree and count into points. And if you don't have a degree, you've got X, Y, Z uh, badges or certificates from individual courses. They also count into points. So what they're doing is leveling the playing field. And at the end, every individual person has a table of points, which would be equivalent to whatever it would be called to a degree. So right now, I think it's still in beta version, but it, it's an interesting concept. Um, so I think the change is coming. But in my mind, the uh, change is about changing currency. Uh, currently, we use college degrees uh, and other kinds of degrees as currency uh, for what we may know or are able to do. And it's about trying to shift our paradigm around how we use that currency. Innovative companies are starting to change the currency that they use to determine qualification. And we, and we do it informally in the form of experience, in the form of other things in, as well. Uh, colleges of education are famous for this. How many states have put in new requirements for teachers uh, around to keep their teaching certificate uh, current? And, and, and how uh, relevant is that, uh, those requirements to actually the quality of teaching? It's a form of currency that doesn't work anymore. Yep. Great. Well, I, I just want to pick up on Jim's comment that um, is my understanding that uh, one of the questions, if not the most significant, that Google asks in an interview is, uh, if you were hired, how would you use the resources of Google to change the world? Now, what a great question that is. Um, so we are c rapidly coming to the end of our hour. This has been a this has been a terrific conversation, and I I knew that once we got all of you on the call, uh, we could easily talk for a couple of hours here, you know, over uh, wine or coffee, depending on what time of day it is. Um, but uh, it is coming to an end, and I don't want to impinge on anybody's time. So let me um, let me uh, open it up with some. Uh, a last question just for you all to, to think about and then we'd love to hear from each one of you um, again you know given your rich experiences and first let me say thank you all of you for for coming on to this uh, this discussion and, uh, and joining us again ideas this has been a really fabulous um, conversation and really beneficial I think to the education system leaders who we're trying to support in as many ways possible not only to introduce new technologies to but stop. also to to share new new learnings and trends yeah. so let me let me ask each of you to answer uh, the question that has to do with um, what you see is going to be um, the the requirements, some practical advice that you would like to give our education leaders for things that they um, need to be doing in the future uh, to really begin to transform education in the ways that, you know, little bit that we touched upon. And believe me, we didn't go super deep, but, you know, a lot of topics were brought up above and beyond, you know, playing games with your students and, <laughs> you know, doing all of those, um, those activities. But I'd love to know specifically what practical advice would you like to share with education system leaders in order to help them begin to truly transform the education system as we see it today. So let me start, and I'm just going to pick Jim, if you won't mind giving us the starting this conversation off uh, and then we'll go to each person. Yeah, I'd be happy to and probably my conver my uh, contribution will be small compared to others, but let me make it anyway. Uh, I would think if educational leaders can help us change the word school to make it equal to uh, l learning for life, uh, that we would have accomplished an awful lot.
get mm -hmm. when they step into the classroom learning community that teachers really need resources in order to engage with their students and students need resources to engage with their teachers to make sure that they have those resources. Two is um, to include families and that is one thing I do love about the Common Core is it's a common language so that everyone gets behind it and gets around it and to really include families in a dialogue. Three would be to ask children what they think. Um, that's something we do at Lit Worlds. That is part of our DNA and that is to say like really look around us and not just ask each other as adults but to bring children in and empower them as leaders for the for the school community what could make this community better what could make us richer and stronger and to actually ask them and then finally I'd say joy is to bring the joy of this this learning and this uh, we said earlier about failure that even that you know is a joyful story I hope one day so anyway I those are the things I would encourage educational leaders to remember Great. Rose? Well, I come from the design background, so I'm going to bring in this word design. If we're going to change the world and we're going to ask the leaders to change it, um, design is an iterative process. It's not a one-time thing. You don't start and finish. You do it. There's the first cycle. There's a the second cycle. And you just keep changing it and making it better every time you do it. So the idea is don't think there's one solution. Um, and the solution that works today won't work tomorrow. It's going to keep changing. So when we say de designing something, you're not doing it once. That, that, that would be my take on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Stephanie. Um, I would um, have leaders think about themselves as um, uh, uh, provocateurs, both of their own leadership, um, the, le the culture that Chip talked about within the community, and um, and ask, uh, cre create conditions um, where teachers feel honored and respected, where children as learners feel honored and respected, and where there is a constant um, curiosity about the assumptions we hold that lead to the behaviors that we enact. So um, I think so often we're going through the motions. We have been in this paradigm that is becoming, I think we're all saying, more and more dysfunctional and so antithetical to who we are as human beings and how we learn that we need leaders to be the, sort of put themselves out there as being, as being sort of the, the quintessential learner, that they're going to fall and they're going to do what Alan says, which I love. And Alan, I'm going to go find somebody and make sure I fail at a game, it's a terrific idea. But challenge the assumptions that we're making that led to the be leads to the behaviors that we have. Uh, because we can, we can, you know, fundamentally we made up the system we have based on what we thought we knew about the mind-brain, based upon what we thought we knew about dynamics and power and control in the system. We can make up something else. We can reimagine and redesign. Thank you. Chip. Um, I'll go back and restate something I stated earlier in, for, in terms of leadership advice. Uh, number one would be that uh, organizational culture means everything. The way that we uh, change the system, whatever system we're responsible for, is by paying attention to culture. Secondly, um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to agree um, as well that uh, people are everything. Um, and one of the challenges that we have right now is that we are not attracting the best and the brightest and the most talented into the education profession because in the United States anyway the education pro profession is not regarded very highly and is, is not resourced in the way that it needs to be and it's just very 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 challenging work and I don't think young people are afraid of the challenge but I do think that they want to be respected and they want their work to be honored and that is not true in in the culture of the United States currently um, so I would say that the second is find ways to impact teacher culture so that we can attract the best talent out there. And third is whatever we do, we have to figure out ways to scale the innovation that we're talking about. Um, where we, we, we have amazing examples throughout the U.S. and, and abroad of great schools. Uh, IMSA, where we have uh, um, two people on the call from IMSA, are good examples of that. But scale it in a Chicago or a Detroit or an Orlando or a Los Angeles. That's the big challenge is how do we scale this? And Alan? 
Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop to a low orbit. Um, <laughs> for, for, for leaders in you know in traditional schools, you know what's the next step? I I I've had great success walking around schools with leaders focused on one question: Who owns the learning? And and that one question can can give a whole new perspective on on the culture. Uh, also practically, because of the time of the year. One of the most interesting conversations I have with teachers these days is what should the first five days of school look like? Mm, okay. And it's such a, a doable, manageable chunk of time mm. that people can get their heads wrapped around that, where it might be really difficult to get your heads wrapped around changing the whole culture at once. But the first five days, you know, how do we set the culture and the expectations and student engagement, all of that, I, I think is is worth a conversation that leaders can can lead. Terrific. Great. Well, again, thank you all. I want to say um, just five little items that I took away from this uh, learning, which was uh, comments that came from from all of you. Allow for failure. Um, play an online game with your students. Leaders need to be flexible and courageous. Remember the ecosystem. Don't forget mobile. And finally, ask lots of questions. So I want to thank you all for, for these great insights. I think it's been a fabulous conversation here today. I hope you continue to stay connected to Get Ideas and, uh, and the work that we're doing. We really uh, want to stay in touch with each and every one of you. And um, definitely look for this on our Google Plus page. You can see some of the chats. Um, feel free to respond to some of our uh, audience members who have been uh, engaged in watching this. And this will be um, saved and broadcast on, on YouTube in our playlist for getideas.org. So thank you again for taking this time. We really appreciate it. Thank Have a good you. day. Good evening. Good to be thank with you. everybody. Bye thank now. you.